In Luke chapter 23, beginning with verse 33, we see that Jesus has already been tried in that mock trial before the Jewish leaders and before Pilate, and he's being taken to be crucified. And in verse 33 of Luke chapter 23, when they had come to the place called the skull, Golgotha, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the other left. There were two criminals that were crucified along with Jesus. But in verse 34, Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I'm thankful for the cross and all the things we find in it. And the first thing we find in it here, my friend, is not merely forgiveness. You say, wait a minute, preacher. It says there, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, yeah, make no mistake of it, but it's not forgiveness like you and I would grant. See, what we find here and what I am thankful for is grace grace we sing amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see and grace has has sort of lost its true meaning it's become diluted because of the many applications that we throw it into but let me remind you of what God's definition of grace is unmerited favor giving you and I something that we do not deserve and not giving us what we do deserve. Paul tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us have missed the mark. That's what that Greek word sin means. It literally means to miss the mark. You're aiming for a target and you can't hit it. You see, because my friend, our sights, the sights on our rifle aren't dialed in. Last night, for the first time, I watched Swamp People. <laughs> have any of you seen Swamp People? By your laugh, I can tell you have. That would have been a show right up my friend Tim Carty's alley. I guarantee you, he watched Swamp People every week. And last night, I was watching these guys trying to shoot a gator with a 22 caliber rifle from what looked like about 50 yards. Now, if you're going to shoot an alligator with a 22 rifle, you better be on top of it, not 50 yards away. Because 50 yards away, that 22 round is just going to bounce off of it. You might not even make him mad because I'm not sure he'd even feel it. Well, this guy got his, his daddy was trying to shoot at it. His daddy couldn't shoot. He said, give me that rifle. And so they, so they, he was shooting at it. He shot him with a 22, and that wasn't enough. So he went and got his new rifle. He had a big 44 rifle with a big scope on it. And, and he still couldn't. He, I still don't think he ever hit it. And, and his... Uh, his brother said to him, you have too many wine coolers last night? His dad blamed it on the sighting on the rifle. Oh, my rifle, my, my sight's bent. But you know, whatever the reason, they weren't hitting the mark. I love to go to the shooting range. I love to shoot. But you know, sometimes sighting it in is the catch, isn't it? Especially the further distance you go, the further out there it is, the more you have to compensate and adjust for it. My friends, you and I, God has given us a mark and it is so high above us that no matter how carefully we aim, we will never be accurate enough to hit that mark. But then Christ comes along. The Bible tells us he is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. And Jesus enters into this world, eternal God. John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Bible tells us that all things were made by Christ, through Christ, and for Christ. He is 100% God. My friend, anybody that tells you Jesus is a created being, or just a man, or just a teacher, or just a prophet, is either misunderstanding it or they are lying because Jesus the Word of God tells us is 100% eternal God who became 100% man you say how can he be 100% God and 100% man because he's God he can do whatever he wants to well I don't understand that folks there's lots of things I don't have I understand I don't have to understand it to make it a reality Jesus was born into this world as a human being for one purpose. Why was that? To die on a cross. My friend, Jesus came to this earth not primarily to heal people, not primarily to do anything, but to die on a cross. 
that through his death, you and I might find forgiveness. You and I didn't deserve it. Well, God created us. It's his fault. No, it's not. Parents, if you have a child that goes their own way, especially after they're out of your house, is it your fault? No. You see, that child has their own mind and their own will, and they can make their own decisions. Even a young child, you can tell that child, now, whatever you do, do not touch that hot plate. Unless you wrap them up in duct tape, which is awfully tempting sometimes. They still got their little fingers free. And they can still reach over there and touch that hot plate and burn it. Ow! Whose fault is it? It's the child's. Because you told them, you taught them, you warned them, you did everything you could, and yet they still reached out and did it. My friend, when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God had told them, gave them very specific instructions of what not to do. There was only one thing they didn't have. You don't do it. Don't eat from that tree. Just that one. You can eat the tree from every fruit of the tree, from every other thing in sight. But just don't eat from that one tree. And what happened? Hmm. Suddenly, every other fruit in the world disappeared but the one on that tree. Satan knew that. It's how he works. It's how he tempts us. The very thing God tells you not to do becomes the rallying cry of the rebel. And that's where we all are. And yet, even in spite of that, the Bible says while we were yet his enemy Christ died for us my friends God didn't send Jesus into the world to die for us because he owed us Jesus died on the cross because he loved us and you see that in the grace that he showed even as he was being crucified his prayer was, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. How different is that from our fleshly mindset? Somebody does us wrong, we pray, God, strike them dead. God, let their car blow up. God, let something really bad happen to them so they'll understand how wrong they've treated me. What did Jesus say? As he was nailed to the cross after he'd already been beaten almost to death, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what You see grace in that. You also see the the, the concept that Jesus looks upon them as children who just don't know any better. Because we don't. The prophet Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. Are sheep evil? Any of you ever raised sheep or dealt with sheep? You don't think of sheep as savage, evil things. I think of snakes as evil things. But you don't think of a sheep. Sheep are just dumb. Sheep just kind of wander around. They'll wander off. That's why you have to have a shepherd. You have to have someone that will guide them. And my friend, certainly we are wicked. But we also many times just don't know any better. And we wander around in our blindness. And in our sin. But that's no excuse. If it was an excuse, Jesus didn't need to die on the cross. My friend, I ask you this question. I've never gotten a satisfactory answer for it in all the years I've asked it. If you can go to heaven by any other way, why did Jesus die on the cross? It would be a monumental waste of time. If all these other religions and all these other ways of thinking and ways of life are going to get to heaven, well, you know, God's not going to send a good person to hell, are they? No, because there are no good people. The Bible tells us there's none good, not one. So God doesn't send good people to hell. He sends wicked people to hell who have rebelled against him and rejected the offer of salvation that he has made. Don't blame God for your rebellion. It's not God's fault. God has done everything he can to keep you out of hell. But my friend to suggest that, well, everybody's going to get to heaven, right? Is an insult to the cross. If there is any other way, not only is the cross a waste of time, but Jesus Christ is the biggest liar in history. Or at least one of them. Because he said... I am the way, the way, very specific, not a way. 
I am the way. I am the truth, not a truth, the truth, absolute truth. The world no longer believes in absolute truth. My friend, belief does not affect reality. There are absolute truths. If you jump off a building, you're going to go splat. The law of gravity is an absolute. If you don't believe it, you're going to find out the hard way. And some people have to find out the hard way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's not a life. He is not an option. He is the only way to have eternal life. And he followed up that statement by saying, no one comes to the Father except through what? Me. My friend, you say, well, you're just a narrow-minded Christian. You Southern Baptists are all a bunch of narrow-minded teetotalers anyways. All you do is eat fried chicken and drink sweet tea and you're against gambling and you're against tattoos and you're against uh, abortion you're against homosexuals you're against this and that and so on and so forth my friend let me tell you something this has little to do with what I am except that I believe it because the Bible says it the fact that Jesus is the only way is not Southern Baptist doctrine it is a core doctrine of Christianity if you believe there is another way to heaven other than through Christ you are not a Christian you are a universalist or you are a secular humanist or you are a Buddhist or you are something else but if you believe my friend that there is one person that is going to reach heaven without going through the blood of Jesus Christ you are mistaken because you cannot be a Christian and disregard what the Word of God said he said I am the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me and that he did all of that while we were his enemies demonstrates true grace <laughs>